Hello and greetings from Zurich, Switzerland. This presentation, I will review the ways in which the medical community approaches teaching listening skills. And I will ask the question, do these techniques really teach anyone how to listen or do they mainly teach practitioners how to give the appearance of listening? Finally, I'll present a method that I've been using for 35 years to teach listening skills. Although my focus will be on healthcare, I believe that what I discuss applies to really any aspect of listening in any field. My name is Kenneth Youngstein. I'm a neuropsychologist by training. In 1975, I was hired by the New York Regional Transplant Program, one of the world's first organizations that managed the recovery and distribution of organs for transplantation. My task was to study how doctors and hospitals explain brain death to the families of potential organ donors and how they open the option, the discussion about organ donation. It was at this time that I decided to devote myself to the field of health communication. During the nearly 50 years that followed, I have worked with industry as well as governmental and non-governmental health organizations throughout the world. The main areas of my work have been in patient education, uh, treatment adherence, and teaching communication skills. I am the CEO of Biocom Limited, a health communication agency, and director of the Foundation for Health and Mind Development. I've been based in Zurich, Switzerland for more than 30 years. Now retired from the commercial side, I work exclusively through my foundation, volunteering my services and supporting educational programs throughout Africa, Asia, and Latin America, focusing mainly on teaching communication skills. I've been a member of the Global Listening Center for five years, and in 2019, I was the very proud recipient of their humanitarian award. Recently, I gave an online workshop to directors of 25 hospitals in Nepal. The main purpose of the workshop was to explain the importance of patient counseling in achieving good clinical outcomes and the benefit to patients, the staff, and the hospital. As part of this, I was promoting the idea that they include dedicated patient counselors on their staff. The concept was surprisingly well received. And at the end, one of the directors asked me, what should we look for when hiring a patient counselor? Good medical knowledge or good communication skills? My answer was, both are desirable, but the most important thing is to find people who are good listeners. Which leads us to the question, how do we teach and assess listening skills? Since the time I began my work, the essential role that communication plays in healthcare has evolved from near total denial to near total acceptance. Today, medical schools and hospitals throughout America and Europe routinely offer or even require courses and workshops on communication skills. So do organizations like the US-based Academy of Communication and Healthcare and the European Association for Communication and Healthcare. I've attended many of their excellent events. Interesting, I have not seen within their curricula any courses that focus strictly on listening. The online platform doccom.org uh, has 42 learning modules, but not one that deals specifically with listening skills. I have bookshelves filled with books on communication skills for healthcare professionals, and also how to teach these skills. Although these author authors acknowledge that listening is a core component of communication, if you go through the index of each book and look for teaching listening skills, you'll find very few entries. In Andrew Wolven's seminal book on listening, Laura Janicek chapter on listening pedagogy concludes that there are really no effective ways of teaching listening. To quote her, the development of listening pedagogy is at a standstill. Yes, this was written in 2010, but I believe that it hasn't changed very much. And why is this so? It's because listening is always seen as a subset 
of communication. And consequently, listening skills is encompassed within communication training courses and rarely taught on its own, at least in healthcare. Therefore, we must look at how communication skills are being taught and ask ourselves, do these techniques actually teach listening skills? Communication skills are basically taught through four different modalities. The first is theory. This is really done with books or lectures or videos. They may be live or recorded in which the experts explain what are the basics of good communication. The second is modeling, which is usually done by the student watching videos or live demonstration on how quote, best to communicate with patients. The third is role play, where students engage in conversations either with fellow students who play the role of the patient or more commonly today with what are called standardized patients. These are actors who have been specially trained to play the role of patients. The fourth technique is to video record real encounters with patients, which are then analyzed. While all of these techniques are useful, each has limitations, especially when it comes to teaching someone how to listen. Watching videos can be very instructive in terms of learning strategies, but they give little or no insight into what the patient or the practitioner is hearing or thinking. In other words, how they listen. Also, these videos usually show only one or a very limited range of situations, which does not contribute significantly to the stated goal of teaching patient-centric communication, where communication style and content is tailored to meet each patient's individual needs and circumstances. And watching videos demonstration provides no opportunities to, to practice these skills. So that is where our next technique comes in, and that's role play. Role play, especially with standardized patients, is now seen as the gold standard for communication training. But role play, as usually performed, also has limitations. First, this type of training is expensive and complex to organize, and therefore reaches only a limited segment of healthcare professionals, namely medical students or those employed in large teaching hospitals. And because they are expensive and complex, Students have very few experiences with this type of training. They may have it once or twice in their entire training. Role play can be conducted in a private setting, just the patient and the student, or it could be done in front of a group. It may be videotaped or not. The conversations typically play out in real time with the student and the patient speaking in a very conversational manner. Sometimes at the end of the exercise, there's a debriefing where the trainer asks both the student and the patient's questions about their experience of the conversation. The trainer may ask the student how he or she felt during the exchange, but I have never seen one ask, what did you hear? Or tell me about the words that this patient used. While patients are, um, while students are engaged in these kinds of exercises, the trainer or other students or researchers often use what's called a standardized observational guide. Now, this is a list of behaviors, as you can see here, um, of the student that, that the student should have demonstrated during the consultation. So each time the student uses one of these behaviors on the list, they get a point, which leads to a score. Now, I see that this could be extremely useful in grading students or doing research, but because they demonstrated these behaviors, does it really tell you if the student was listening. How do these communication programs really approach teaching listening skills? All courses I have seen promote the concept of what is commonly called active listening techniques. It's a term I'm sure you're all familiar with. And it describes a list of behaviors, including be attentive, maintain eye contact and lean in, ask open and probing questions, Use encouraging statements or utterances such as, oh, tell me more. Or, mm -hmm. Do not interrupt. Do not judge. Request clarification. Paraphrase what the, the person has just said to you. Be attuned to body language, both the other person's and your own. Reflect feelings. Oh, I can see that you're concerned about your daughter. And then at the end, to always summarize. So 
to assist students in using these techniques, trainer, trainers in communication have come up with an endless list of mnemonics. Rule, all, ors, pearls, ice, afford, art, build, these are just a few. The Cleveland Clinic developed its own training paradigm. It's called Ready, Relationship, Establishment, Development, Engagement. And within that, there is also mnemonics such as save, view, and aria. Here is another one, which is very interesting, called Sage and Time, developed by Manchester University in England in 2016. And what makes this special is that it is the only program that I've seen where the stated goal was to teach listening skills. And this was listening skills for nurses. So the S stands, SAGE stands for setting the environment, ask, gather, empathy. Time is for talk, help, you, me, end. And what's interesting about this is how it was taught. So first there is a written description of the technique or it may be presented as a lecture. But to practice the skills and to assess the student's understanding of this paradigm, the authors created a written, a series of written dialogues between a patient and a nurse. The student then reads these dialogues and indicates on a written worksheet which of the sage and time behaviors the nurse is using at any time during the dialogue. So in effect, this is a course about listening that requires no listening. Now, there have been some efforts to move communication training into the realm of online or computer-based learning. I already mentioned .com, and many medical schools or hospitals have their own online programs now. These are mostly recorded lectures and modeling video along with some exercises. More recently, uh, there have been some other efforts to put this online into what are called communication simulators. Here is a well-known one that uses av av avatars, uh, animated cartoon characters as the patient. In its simplest form, there is a list which you can see on the side, um, which is basically questions that you might ask this patient. And you click on what you think is the best question, and then the cartoon character responds, gives you an answer to that question. Interesting. But I don't know the world you live in, but in my world, when I talk to somebody, a screen doesn't come down from the sky. And I look at it and I go, oh, uh, C, that's the best question I could ask. I have to talk to people. So I find these forms of so-called simulators to be extremely artificial. And, and not representative of the real world. More recently, there have been more sophisticated um, simulators with um, animations, again, not with real people. And these use artificial intelligence that listen for keywords that you may have said, and then it influences the response that the patient will give you. I'm a bit uncertain about the future of these because keywords can be very misleading. I can say the, all the right words, but if I don't say them in the right way, in the right sequence, with the right meaning, I don't know that this is really a very good reflection or a substitute. So I think I'll leave it up to you and to time to tell us whether or not these approaches will really enhance our ability to listen. So all the teaching approaches I have described have one thing in common. They all... Um, focus on overt behaviors, what the patient does, rather than what they actually hear. So this style of teaching results in what I say is the appearance of listening rather than listening itself. And I believe that listening is not a set of external behaviors. Listening is a set of internal processes. So I propose the question is, how can you train internal processes and how can you externalize these internal processes so that you can then assess them? So I would like to share with you uh, an alternative approach, something that I've been using for 35 years worldwide throughout the world. And um, so this may or may not, and I leave it up to you to, present an, a different way of approaching listening training. So first I ask the question, 
to whom do you listen? There are several sources. First, you have to listen to the data. The data is really any information you already have about this patient or in a non-medical world about the person you're talking to. The doctor is rarely the first person a patient encounters, especially in a hospital setting. So by the time the patient sees the doctor, there's already a lot of information. They call it the patient's chart or patient history or medical history. It is a narrative. It tells a story about this patient, the person you're gonna to talk to. Doctors, nurses, people in this field must learn to listen to this story and select the information that will guide them as they engage the patient. Now, of course, there is information about normal health status, what are the lab results, the current problem, comorbid conditions, but the chart also tells a lot of other information. Their age, which is an important factor in diagnosis and treatment, but also in the way in which you communicate. Their occupation, their address, how far do they live from the hospital? How do they get there? How will this impact follow-up for a patient that's going to require a, uh, a lot of follow-up in their treatment? Are they married or not? Important for knowing what level of support they may have. What's their education level? What is their language? So I've just returned from uh, doing 11 days of teaching in Ghana, West Africa. Uh, I taught over 800 medical professionals. And this specific topic of looking at the patient's chart and what you can find, I think, stimulated the most interesting discussions when people began to learn, my God, there's so much I know about this person that I never really thought about just by looking at their medical history. So then after you listen to the data, you have to listen to the patient and the patient's family, whoever else is involved with you at the time. And finally, you have to listen to yourself. Now, listening to yourself is on many levels. How do you feel about this patient? What are you feeling? Do you like them? Do you dislike them? Do they make you feel comfortable or uncomfortable? A quick aside, I was using this approach with teaching financial advisors in England. And financial advisors very often are women. And we set very, very strong character types for their clients. And then we asked them, do you like or do you dislike this client, this person? And we found that those who liked the person or disliked them came to totally different conclusions about what are their needs and recommended completely different financial products for them based upon how they felt about this person. So listening to yourself and your own emotions, your own reaction to this person is very, very important in terms of how you will screen what you hear and what you say. Do you have any biases or prejudgments? What are your goals? What do you want for this meeting and also for long-term? You have to ask yourself, what do you not know? What was not in the patient's history or what you heard from your colleagues about this person that you really need to know? And then based upon your own experience with other patients, what kind of assumptions can you make about the course of their care? And then very important, listen to yourself as you're speaking to them. What do you hear? Are your words consistent? to everything else that you have been thinking about. In the late 1980s, I developed a method that I believe addresses many of the issues that we have just described, that I have just described. Uh, this is called ACT, A-C-T, Active Communication Training. It can be used in groups in a class setting, or it can be used individually online. So the concept is quite simple. There are only two basic requirements. First is, be prepared, that's the whole business about listening to the data. And then always talk last. Listen, analyze, strategy, and talk. I know it's another mnemonic, but even if you don't make it a mnemonic, the concept is fairly straightforward in any language in which I work. So what does last really mean? Well, listen means, well, what did the person just say? I mean, what were the words? Words matter. A is for analyze, what are the key components of what they said? So these are both two essential parts of listening. What was said, what was the content, what is important, what is not. Then we go on to developing a strategy. A strategy is, okay, that's what you heard, that's what's going on, how are you going to deal with this? Don't talk about what you're going to say, but talk about 
about what you're going to say? What are the important components of what you want to say? What are things that you might not want to say? And after you have done these things, and finally you have earned the right to talk to this patient. And all too often we get it wrong. We put the talking first and everything else afterwards. So let's see how this works. I'm gonna show you an example, a series of courses that we designed a few years ago to teach motivational interviewing techniques to nurses who counsel MS patients, multiple sclerosis patients. It was funded by Bayer Pharmaceuticals. It was used in 23 countries, nearly as many languages. It was taught both in groups and in individual sessions. So let's start with the first patient, Ariana. Ariana is 28 years old. She's a graphic designer. She's been married for two years. Her husband, Philip, is 32. He's an IT specialist, no children. She first had her first onset of multiple sclerosis at age 26, two years ago which was six months after her marriage. She's educated, she's informed, independent, career-oriented. So far, she's been extremely adherent to treatment. Her husband is extremely supportive of her therapy. And the visit notes say the last visit was three months ago, at which time you discussed ways to reduce infection site uh, inflammation. And as you may or may not know, uh, these injections that patients take for, for multiple sclerosis often cause some rather nasty uh, inflammation at the site of the injections. So the instructor then says to the group of patients, to the group of students, excuse me, <laughs> okay, class, what do you know about her? Tell me, describe Ariana. What don't you know? What kind of assumptions can you make based upon the information you have and your own knowledge about MS? And what are your goals for this meeting? So the students in the class begin to talk about, okay, we know this about her from her, from her history, blah, blah, blah. We don't know this about her. And they all sort of, until they come up to a, basically a consensus. At which point, the, it's time to actually meet her. And uh, we, she plays this video. It's good to see you again. Please have a seat. At the end of this short video, this, the, the instructor says to the class, okay, that's fine. You're ready to start. How are you gonna open the session? What are you gonna say? What are you not gonna say? What are the key elements? Tell me about your approach. Now, the opening of any discussion is one of the key factors that sets the stage for a discussion. So once again, the students in the group say, ah, I wanna talk about this, I wanna talk about that, and these are the key elements. And basically, it's, the opening should be a bridge between the last visit and your current visit. So last time we were together, we talked about these things, and uh, this time I want to talk about uh, you know, how, how, how's that been going for you, and if there's anything that I can do to help you. So once they've done that, she replays the video. It's good to see you again. Please have a seat. And this time, the students in the room talk to the monitor. They talk to if this is projected on a screen. They each sit there and they say, oh, hello, Ariana. It's good to see you again, et cetera. And then the next one tries it. And so they all have the opportunity to now try and express in real words their strategy for how they're going to open the session. So as I said, the opening question was basically, uh, you know, how have you been doing since I saw you last? Now we're going to play her answer. All in all, I'm feeling quite well. Sure, the injections aren't very pleasant, but I followed your advice about rotating the sides and using the correct injection technique, as well as regularly applying a moisturizer. It's really much better. In fact, I'm feeling so normal. I started thinking about the future, not just getting from day to day. You have to understand, Philip was married before. In fact, he was still going through his divorce when we met. One of the key problems in his marriage was that he wanted kids, but she didn't. When Philip and I started talking about getting married, a large part of the discussion was about us having kids. 
six months after the wedding, I had my first symptoms and, well, you know the rest. Recently, I've been thinking, since I'm doing so well on the medication and there have been no relapses, maybe this is a good time to have a baby. Philip isn't pressuring me, really. I think you know how supportive he's been since I got sick. I know how much he wants a child, but I also know he would never want me to do anything that could hurt me. Look, I don't know what the future holds, but somehow this seems right. Even thinking about it is exciting, but also pretty scary. I spoke with my neurologist. I looked at various patient websites and I read several articles. But I still don't know what to do. So, that was her answer. At the end of this, the instructor will say to the group, okay, what did she say? Try to repeat her words as closely as possible. Words matter. How did she say it? What is there about the language, the kind of terms that she used to describe it? And what were the key messages? What really in all of this was, was really important that you should address? And once again, the students will, some will mention this and others will say, yeah, but she also talked about that. And yes, and this was important. And, and the kind of words, this constant use about trying to be normal seems to be so important to her. And, and you know, her concern, you know, her, her relationship to her husband, all of these kinds of, of things are discussed or brought out. And so rather than focusing upon, did I nod my head? Did I, mm -hmm, did I do all these overt behaviors? This program is actually asking the student to listen. What did she say? What about the word? What were the key messages that were in here? So after they've done this, the instructor then shows the slide and it shows exactly what she said. And now the students can say, yes, we got this, we got that. Oh, but nobody really picked up on this question, on this point. And so it is a chance for them to then validate and to check on how well they listened. So then after this essential first part of listening comes the next part of listening, which is the analytical part of it. Now we know the words, we know what she said. What did we learn? What don't we know? What do we need to ask at this point? What are the key points, the key messages here? And so analysis and this listening to the words to me is really what listening is all about. So as the program goes on, it doesn't just stop there. It also goes on to what's the strategy part, which is, okay, that's what she said. Tell me about how you will respond to what she said. What are the key points you want to include? Is there anything you want to avoid saying in this instance? And here the students, again, don't focus on what they're going to say, but they have to talk about it. Oh, I want to respond by doing this. And I sense that she has this ambivalence and I want to address that. And I want to do this. And I want to, you know, and they develop a communication strategy for how they're going to respond. Finally, the, instruction, the instructor then replays at least the last part of the previous video. And then each of the students takes turn talking to Ariana to actually expressing, putting all this theory into practice with real words. And at the end of this, each one, or at the very end, the members of the class or the instructor, instructor can then give feedback to the person. Yes, your, your response to her didn't really reflect what you just said was your goals. You, you use other kinds of words. So this is the technique that we use in order to teach listening skills, not just the overt behavior of listening, but the real behavior. Because I'm sure that you all can have experienced that we can listen to somebody and nod our head and do all the things that active listening requires and not really be listening. But you can't fool this system. This system actually requires that you listen. So in this program, I talked previously about this idea of patient-centric communication. That means tailoring to every need. So we just don't have this one situation. 
We have Christine here also, who is deeply depressed. How do you deal with her? You have Peter, who is in a new relationship after his divorce and doesn't want to tell his new girlfriend about his MS, so he's trying to hide it from her and is thinking of ways that maybe he can take a holiday from his medication so that he won't have the, these nasty injections on his body the first time he gets undressed. And then there is Karen, who is a teenager facing the problems of MS. So this is how this approach could be used on a team basis. But we also have the, oh, I'm, again, just talking about patient-centric, excuse me. In our um, program on, um, on organ donation, this is about half of the different families that we created to train people how to talk to different kinds of groups of people about brain death and organ donation. So what about individual learning? Well, we also have an approach for that. And when I started doing this in 1988, uh, computers were not as sophisticated as they are today in terms of handling media. So we had to build this thing called the box. And uh, luckily, Computers have advanced, and today the ACT software, the Active Communication Training Simulator, can be run on any laptop computer, or we have a iPhone, uh, an, an iPad uh, app for it that's available in the, the app store. And how does this work? Well, uh, I'm going to play for you a short demonstration. This is a short demonstration of our online software that allows users to basically work alone from any location, any time. So they would go to a dedicated website and log in, and then they would select from the various courses which course they want to complete. For this demonstration, we're going to go with a program from our multiple sclerosis communication program, and we're going to meet Karen. Now in the online software, we want to make certain that the camera and the microphone are working properly. So first, before we start a course, there's always a short test. I click on record, I speak for a few seconds, I stop, and I hit playback. Of course, there's always a short test. I click on record, I speak for a few seconds. So clearly this is working, so we can now proceed with the course. So it opens with some instructions about the course, and then there is the patient history. Um, this basically can be either the real patient chart or it could be just a summary of information. And then the program asks me, well, what do I know about Karen? What do I already know based upon her history, but also my own knowledge of MS? What kind of assumptions can I make about a teenager who is on these medications? When I'm ready to answer, I click on the button. I start thinking aloud. I talk to the camera. And I say, look, I know she's 17. She's had MS now for one year diagnosed. She's been extremely compliant with the medications. But she's a teenager, and there will be problems. There are going to be problems about body image and, and other things that will come up. So I really have to work with her very carefully to make sure that she keeps on track. When I'm finished, I click here, and I can play back my answer. I start thinking aloud. I talk to the camera. And I say, look, I know she's said And while I'm listening to my answer, I can click here on the Help button. And this gives me a, a list, basically, of the kinds of things I should have been able to address in my, in my answer, what I know and what kind of assumptions I could have made. If I'm satisfied, I go on. If I want to do it again, I can hit the replay button and I can do the page again. But let's go forward. So next, what are my goals and strategy? Well, again, when I'm ready, I click on the button. I think aloud. I talk about what my goals are for this session, what my overall strategy would be. When I'm ready, I click here, and then I can listen to my answer. On the next page. I know, I should be reading my history book, but this is much more interesting. Now, again, it asks me about my strategy for opening the session. This is one of the most critical parts of any kind of a meeting with a patient or anyone, is how you open it. So basically here, I would think aloud. It's not asking me to say, what is my opening, but to talk about it. So for example, I click here, I think out loud, and I want to tie it in between my previous visit and the current visit. I want to ask her how she's doing. I certainly don't want to say to her, oh, your mother tells me that you're not being as, as, as adherent with your therapy these days. I want her to tell me that herself. So that's my basic strategy. I stop, 
I can listen to my video, I think out loud, and I want to tie it in between my, and once again, I can look at a help screen. Now that I've expressed my strategy, on the next page, it will give me an opportunity to actually open the conversation. I know, I should be reading my history book, but this is much more interesting. Hi, Karen. It's good to see you again. I know it's been a couple of months since I visited you last, and I'd really like to know basically how are things going uh, with your medication and in general, and uh, if there's anything that I can help you with. Now, you will notice that as soon as she stopped speaking before, the camera was automatically activated. That's unlike the previous ones where I thought out loud and I was able to say, okay, I'm starting and stopping. This time, the moment she said something, I was on, just like in real life. The only thing that I had to do was to click the stop button. So I can play back. Hi, Karen. It's good to see you again. I know it's been a couple of months since I visited you last. And I'd really like to know, basically, how are things going uh, with your medication and in general? And uh, if there's anything that I can help you with. So you'll notice that it's not only recording my voice, but also my body language, how I behave when I'm talking to her. So in the next page, we're going to get her answer to my question, how are things going? At first, it wasn't so bad. I tried really hard to follow all the instructions, especially the injections. You said there could be, oh, what did you call it? Injection site reactions? <laughs> I thought you meant a tiny little red dot or something, but it's much worse. Not only that, I'm always really tired. And to make things worse, my mom is always on my back about taking the injections. So, what did she say? Can I repeat her words as closely as possible? So when I'm ready, I click here and I try and repeat what she has said to me. When I'm finished, I click, I can look at my recording and I try and repeat and I can see a transcription of exactly what she said. And this will allow me to know whether or not I actually caught everything that she was talking about. Or was I so hung up on the first thing that she said that I stopped listening and I missed everything after that? When I'm ready, I go on to the next page, which then says analysis. What are the key issues that were raised? And so here again, I click here, I think out loud. She talked about injection sites were much more dramatic. The inject, you know, the, the, the mark from the injections were much stronger than she ever imagined. And uh, yeah, and she's always uh, fighting with her mother ab about taking her medications. So I click here, I can watch my video, I click here, I think out loud, and I also have the screen. And it says, ah, the key issues were injection site inflammation, chronic fatigue, oh, I missed that one completely. You see, I was so busy thinking about that, I caught that and the relationship with her mother, but I completely missed her problem of chronic fatigue. So. This gives you an idea of basically how our online software works. There are certain pages where I think aloud, which means I have a manual record. I click when I'm ready and then I record my, my thoughts. I have help screens, but then there are also times where I get to talk directly to the patient, in which case there's an automatic record function, which records me as soon as I, as I, as, as I should start speaking. The important thing to remember here is that this continues throughout the whole interaction with the patient until the end. When I'm finished with this, I then get to the last page and I could either choose to save it or to, re to, um, to delete the recording. If I want to save the recording, then I can either keep it private or I can share it with others. This is a short demonstration of our online. This is a, oh, here we go, sorry. So I've just demonstrated our online software and I wanted to make uh, the point that um, this is just an example of how this can be done. I'm not trying to promote our software. You can do it yourself. Um, 
If you want to use our software, it is available free of charge to all nonprofit organizations, universities, schools, whatever you want to have. But that's really not what, what, what my goal was there. What I was really trying to show is that there are techniques which can look directly at listening skills and not the appearance of listening. And so I hope that I've made that case. I welcome your, your comments, your suggestions. I can be reached at this address and uh, I look, look forward to hearing from you. So I'm gonna stop and share now and say goodbye. And um, yes, and I hope to hear from you and I look forward to interacting with you on, on, at other times um, at live events and not just in this, this uh, virtual format. So thank you all very much. Please all be well and safe. Thank you and goodbye.